I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Uh, Patrick Thibodeau has long been a friend of PXC International, an expert in the family of genes in which ABCC6 lives. The Terry's consulted him to try and understand better what the gene might be responsible for. Patrick has done incredible work and has advanced our understanding of PXC as you will now hear. Welcome, Patrick. Well, thank you, and uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. If you have any questions or want to stop and get clarification, feel free to, to interrupt. I'm completely open to stop and go kinds of talks. And uh, it's a pleasure to present a bit of the work we've been doing the last, well, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, Pat uh, and uh, Sharon approached me about doing some structural biology on ABCC6 to try and understand how ABCC6 plays a role in uh, the development of PXE. So it's exciting that we've been able to, to make some progress on that front, and uh, I'll show you that today. So first thing I'd like to do is just acknowledge the people in the lab who've done a lot of the work, and most of the work that uh, I'm gonna show you today was the work of two talented postdocs, a woman by the name of Yan Chao Ran, who did a lot of the biochemistry I'm gonna show, and then all the structural biology um, has been done by Ai Ping Zhang, who's currently in the lab. And of course, we've gotten support from a variety of sources to facilitate this research and uh, have to thank the, those folks as well. So my lab sort of takes a different approach to things, I think, than a lot of the labs that have been involved in PXE to date. And I think that's in part the reason that the Terry's asked me to get involved with PXE research. But we, we like to work not at the level of the organism like the mouse or the human, but really at the molecular level to understand what goes wrong first. And in my mind, and the way we think about things, of course, uh, heritable diseases or genetic diseases start with mutations in the DNA. And this often gives rise to defects in the proteins, which is the next bit along the pathway. We really think about these as being the primary defects that the DNA gets mutated and that causes some change in the structure of the proteins. And as a result, then the protein is unable to do uh, the work that it has evolved to do in the physiological setting. In this case, to facilitate the production or release uh, of pyrophosphate into the circulatory system. And so we can think about this as a pathway that we move from the upper left to the lower right, where this sort of becomes more downstream when we think about the physiology. And of course, from a, from a patient's perspective, the loss of pyrophosphate in the circulation is currently thought to underline the mechanisms of disease but the, the really the primary defect comes from the fact that the protein is not being made or not being uh, made in a functional uh, state. And so this is the, the physiological effect is really, in our mind, secondary to the molecular effects of mutations on these proteins. And we often think about classic pharmacology. Most drugs that we're prescribed or that we go buy off the shelf sort of turn things on and off and we can turn transporters or receptors on and off. And, and in fact, uh, the VEGF uh, treatments that have been uh, used in PXE are, are much this way that we can blunt a pathway. Uh, and of course, there are other ways that we can think about modulating physiology. And so one is sort of the ongoing work that's developed around pyrophosphate uh, supplementation and dietary pyrophosphate intake, which I know Andrash has talked about, and I think in a couple of, of the upcoming uh, webinars, there'll be more discussion about pyrophosphate supplementation as a, as a therapeutic strategy. There's also uh, a lot of thought in other fields about finding drugs that actually fix the structural defects associated with the protein. So in theory, if the mutation found in the gene causes the protein in the center of the screen to adopt the wrong shape, we might be able to find drugs that actually fix this problem. And in fact, there are very good examples of this now in cystic fibrosis where we have uh, multiple compounds, drugs that are either in the clinic or in late stage clinical trials that fix defects associated with the structure of the protein. And as a result of fixing this structural defect, we fix the physiological uh, defects as well. And of course, that's a very exciting and sort of a a newer avenue of pharmacology. 
And of course, as we think about moving ahead, there will be lots of talk about gene editing and, uh, and gene therapy where we actually can fix the defects in the, D, uh, in the DNA itself. Although I think this is probably years away from being implemented in, in human uh, patients. So the way we approach this in the lab is to think about the genetics of how to make a protein. And what we need at the end of this pathway is a protein that looks like this little curly Q and colorful uh, scribble on the right hand side of the screen. And this is a molecular machine that actually does work in the cell. And for, for us to have the cell make that, we have to have the DNA uh, encode the gene that gets transcribed into an RNA molecule. And then that gets translated into a protein. And this first sort of half of this process to go from DNA to RNA to protein was worked out in the mid 20th century. And this is very, very well understood. Um, we can look at DNA sequences and predict and, and know exactly what the protein sequence would be like. But it's very hard for us to look at a protein sequence. Uh, and a protein, when it gets made, is a linear polymer. It's just a chain of amino acids. Uh, that then has to fold into this three-dimensional structure. And this second part of the pathway where we go from this linear polypeptide coming off the, uh, the ribosome that's being made here in the cell so that it folds up into this appropriate three-dimensional structure is really not well understood. We don't have the ability to look at a, a protein sequence, these little cyan uh, circles that are coming off this uh, ribosome in, in, in the case of this cartoon and uh, know exactly what the shape of the protein that these amino acids would code for, nor can we look at these sequences and accurately predict in most cases, if we make mutations in the protein sequence, what that will do um, to the functional protein at the end of this pathway. And I will say that probably most mutations alter uh, protein folding and structure. Um, they, they don't actually directly impact the function, the work that the protein does, but more how that protein gets made in the cell and how it actually adopts this uh, three-dimensional structure. Again, the, the colorful thing on the far right-hand side. So my lab is principally interested in trying to understand these processes, these processes of protein, what we call biosynthesis, the production of protein in the cells and how they fold in the cells and how that affects uh, human diseases with the idea that if we could understand these defects uh, better, we might be able to think about developing uh, strategies to find therapeutics to fix these problems, or we might be able to develop therapeutics directly from uh, these kinds of studies. We've been interested for a long time in the ABC transporters, and of course, um, ABCC6, which underlies PXE, is a member of this family of proteins. We can look at these in the cell, and so sort of this is a cartoon of a cell and the light blue is the cell body, and then there's some intracellular compartments that I have colored green and, and purple. And the bottom line is that proteins, when they get made, um, start their life in the ER. And so when we start producing proteins, they're actually uh, synthesized, newly produced in the ER, and they have to work their way through an assembly line. It's a the cell is basically a factory for these proteins. And the assembly line takes them out of what we call the ER, or the endoplasmic reticulum, through a subcellular compartment known as the Golgi apparatus. And then in our case, out to the plasma membrane. Mutations can affect this process. And in fact, here are two proteins that we express in the same cell. We can differentially color the two proteins so that the wild type protein, which is the normal protein, starts in the ER and it traffics all the way out to the cell periphery to the edges of the cell. And that's what you see in red um, on the left in the cell. If we look at a mutant, so we just make a single point mutation in exactly the same protein, we can differentiate these two by uh, staining them with the different colors, we can see that the mutant gets stuck in this endoplasmic reticulum or ER compartment on the inside of the cell. And this is the result of the protein not acquiring its appropriate three-dimensional conformation and not being able to traffic out to the, the periphery of the cell where it functions. And in this case, the loss of this protein gives rise um, not to, to PXE, this happens to be CFTR, what we're looking at in this slide, but gives rise to cystic fibrosis. But we see exactly the same phenomenon when we look um, at ABCC6 with many of the mutations. And of course, 
Others have looked at this as well. Andras Farati and Olivier Lasseau have looked at um, biosynthetic mutations and have looked at ways that we might be able to use chemicals to facilitate the delivery of protein um, from the ER out to the plasma membrane. So there are many people thinking about these uh, processes. So if we think about ABCC6 and what we wanted to tackle with ABCC6, when Pat and Sharon approached me, we really wanted to understand what the structure of ABCC6 um, looked like. And understanding the protein structure from a biophysical point of view, I'm, I'm a trained biophysicist, so we spend half our life thinking about physics and half our life thinking about uh, biology, um, enables us to, to really sort of uh, understand how changes in the shape of the protein underlie change in, it, in the function. And it allows us to probe these pathways of biosynthesis so that we can get a better picture of what's going on with the protein that uh, has more detail than just it's the green or the red uh, color that I showed you in the prior slide. So we know ABCC6 is a member of what we call the ATP binding cassette or ABC transporter family of proteins. It's expressed in the membrane of uh, multiple tissues. I think most people are aware that it's most highly expressed in the liver of the kidney, although it's expressed in a lot of peripheral tissues as well. And right now, we, we the field believes that it facilitates the export of nucleotide triphosphates, although I think the mechanisms by which it does this still remain a, a little unclear. And we can draw cartoons, um, much like the one I have on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, based on what we know about this family of protein. In fact, when uh, the protein was originally cloned, it was immediately recognized to be a part of this family of proteins. And we could draw cartoons that look like this about 15 years ago, uh, based on what we knew about the family. But really the question was, what's unique about ABC66 that causes it to give rise to PXE when it's mutated and are ways that we can manipulate the structure to, to alleviate the uh, defects associated uh, with uh, ABCC6 and PXE. And we start basically by looking at the two sort of semicircular domains that are at the bottom of the protein. And for lots of technical reasons, it's very hard to work with the top part of the protein that's formed by all these little cylinders. So the goal initially was to start with um, the cytosolic nucleotide binding domains. These reside in the water compartment on the inside of the cell and they bind ATP. And I'll show you that in the next slide to facilitate movement of a substrate across the biological membrane. And I'll show you that in the next slide or two, what we think that looks like. We knew from prior studies that these nucleotide binding domains, and this is from another ABC transporter, I'll show you the ABC C6 structures in a few slides, went through a catalytic cycle where they uh, started their life separated from one another and they were not bound to nucleotides. So in this case, they bind a molecule uh, ATP at the interface, sort of uh, right between these two protein uh, structures uh, shown at top and bottom. And when they do that, it drives this conformation of the protein into this what we call a dimer state, where the two NBDs now are juxtaposed and they make a sandwich with the ATP bound uh, in between this interface. And so th these are just three different structures actually from different ABC transporters that give us the view of sort of the two extremes where we have the NBDs that are fully separated on the left-hand side, NBDs that are starting to come together in the center, and then NBDs that are fully dimerized on the right-hand side. And we think the way this works is that you start in the APO state, you bind the ATP, we do chemistry on the ATP that then causes the ATP to be converted to ADP. So we break the ATP down. And in doing so, we have the energy of these proteins binding one another and the energy of this chemistry that we can use to transport molecules across the membrane. And then the, these molecules, once they have uh, had the chemistry done on them, come off and we basically reset the cycle. So we go back to the right-hand side. And you can think about this sort of just moving back and forth as a ping pong or running in a circle, uh, sort of a clockwise circle that started in the APO state. So what does this do in terms of transport? I mean, these are just one piece of the protein. We do have structures of ABC transporters that have been solved, and I hope these movies will come across. If they, if they don't, please somebody speak up. 
But um, in this case now, the nucleotide binding domains, the, the soluble part that binds the ATP are sort of this orange circle and this white circle, circular area, or globular area at the bottom. And then the parts that are in the membrane are actually sort of these helical or cylindrical extensions that run up through the membrane. So these blue lines represent the plasma membrane, the envelope of the cell, the outside of the cell is at the top of the slide, the inside of the cell is at the bottom of the slide. And if we start with the structure of an ABC transporter where there's no ATP bound, so that the nucleotide binding domains are separate from one another, we can start to bind ATP and what we'll see is that the nucleotide binding domains come together on the inside of the cell. And as we do that, we basically can take a substrate that binds sort of in this hole at the very beginning of the movie. And it basically enters this cavity and it gets pushed through a tunnel so that it can emerge on the outside of the cell. And I can show you that we have to rotate the protein 90 degrees. So the membrane is still up here at the top of the cell with the outside of the cell, the very top of the slide, the inside, the bottom of the slide. We've basically taken the protein and just rotated it 90 degrees. And what you'll see now the ATP is binding, the NBDs are coming together. We've opened a hole on the outside of the cell and what has now gone through the tunnel can emerge into the outside cavity. And we think this is the way that whatever the substrate for ABCC6 is, gets transported, that it binds in this region initially, we undergo this large change in the protein shape and that pushes it out of the cell. So that was really the model for the, that is the model for the way ABC proteins work. Um, ABCC6 may have um, subtle differences from some of the other uh, transporters, but um, essentially will we'll look something very similar. What we've been interested in trying to understand is how mutations affect not only that functional process, but how we actually get these structures out of the protein. And we start again by making a linear polypeptide. So we have to begin the production of protein with the, the first bits of the protein. And then as the protein grows, if you will, we basically build on additional pieces of the protein as translation continues. So we start at the very beginning of the protein, we translate the first bit, we translate a second bit, a third bit, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've been wanting to understand is how this process really works in the cell, how these structures are affected by disease causing variants or disease associated variants so that we could think about how we might modulate this for therapeutics. And that's really what I'm saying here is that uh, the two goals that I'm going to tell you a little bit about today is what are the structures and biosynthetic pathways these proteins look like and then there are mechanisms that we could think about leveraging for the development of drugs that would solve problems associated with the disruption of this process. So just a couple of silly slides here. Um, we spend a lot of our time actually making proteins. So instead of working with mice or rats or uh, other live animals, zebrafish, like a lot of the PXE labs do. We actually spend most of our time growing bacteria and yeast. Um, we grow very large quantities of this, gallons at a time, so that we can purify the protein, we can analyze the protein, and then uh, we actually crystallize these proteins. And much like uh, making salt or sugar crystals when we were in uh, grade school, we do the same thing with proteins so that we can basically look at their structures. So that's sort of the flow path for most of what we do. We end up with uh, protein crystals, uh, either protein samples or protein crystals that are um, very small. These are um, difficult to get, um, but they allow us to get the structures of the proteins. So here are just a handful of crystals that we've grown in the lab. They, they're not ABCC6 crystals that I'll show you uh, in a minute, but they're pretty to look at, at least for me. So I like showing them. Once we get these, we use a variety of light sources to actually look at the protein crystals and the proteins. We can use x-rays to determine the structures of the proteins um, at very high resolution. So we can basically see individual atoms uh, in the protein structures themselves. But we also use a variety of spectroscopic uh, approaches where we use other uh, ranges of light to look at uh, protein dynamics and, and energetics. So we get a picture of not only what the structure looks like, but kind of how it works. So what we've done um, to date that I'm going to show you uh, in the next few slides is really to focus in on um, the two nucleotide binding domains. We call these the easier parts of the protein, again, um, for technical reasons, working with these uh, cylindrical parts of the protein that are embedded in the membrane. Uh, are, are, this is a very challenging approach. 
but these give us the ability uh, to produce large quantities of proteins and evaluate many of the proteins uh, in fairly high resolution and high detail. So we start by uh, looking at the sequences of the proteins, and we're not going to spend any time looking at this, but basically we can make these large alignments of a variety of proteins, and we can look for the common elements that define the important features of the protein. And in evolution, what we know is when nature finds a solution to a problem, it tends to keep that solution. And as a result, if we look at many, many protein sequences, we see there are regions that in this alignment are colored black, where we basically have these sequences where nature has optimized to do some function. And this actually defines the first nucleotide binding domain or that first sort of semicircular domain in our cartoon uh, that I've been showing you uh, to date. So we've produced those proteins. We've managed to get crystals of those. Those are shown in the panels on the upper left. These are crystals are, um, if I'm gonna be honest, are kind of ugly looking, but they diffracted so that we got structures at 2.3 angstrom um, resolution, which allows us to basically see all of the atoms um, and chemical bonds in uh, the proteins. And we typically look at these proteins by drawing these cartoon-like structures that are shown on the right-hand part of the screen. So this is the first nucleotide binding domain. We've colored it based on some structural features. I'll show you that in a movie in just a minute. But this part is um, one of the two halves of the protein that would bind ATP, and ATP will be uh, bound in about this position of the protein uh, that I'm showing with the cursor here. And uh, that would induce the dimerization with NBD2, which I'll show you in a moment. So we can take a look. Um, there's a couple of movies here just to kind of explain some of the features. So I'll turn this one on. This is uh, just how we think about these proteins. There are three subdomains, the, what we call a beta subdomain, a core subdomain uh, shown in purple here, and then a green alpha helical uh, subdomain. And this is true for all of the nucleotide binding domains and all ABC transporters, that this part of the structure, regardless of what the uh, proteins do, is well conserved. And we see this pattern and this structure preserved across this family of proteins. So in the core of these proteins, we, hide, we bind and hydrolyze ATP. So the ATP molecule we don't have in the structure, but we can model it in. So now we have the ATP and a magnesium that are bound here, and this is important for the catalysis, for the chemistry that these proteins do. And then we're just going to walk through these, the common features of all these NBDs. Um, we had a Walker A that showed up, a Walker B, this LSGGQ, an H loop sequence, a D loop sequence now, Q loop sequence will come up next, and then what we call the A loop. And I'm going to pause it when this comes up in a second. And the point of this is just, just to show you that really all of these sequences that are colored balls here surround this ATP. And this is the part of the protein that sort of does the hard work. This is the motor that drives the transport that moves the ATP out of the cell. And it's really by binding the ATP in this site and then this coming together um, with the other half, which would be at the top of the screen, that we can provide energy for the transport process to get things secreted from the cells. So we've done exactly the same thing with NBD2. We just have another sequence alignment to, to show that the domain boundaries look the same. You can see we have crystals in the upper left and then structures shown on the right. And they, these structures are very similar. There's some subtle details about the differences between the two nucleotide binding domains. In this structure, we managed to get nucleotide. We didn't get ATP. We got a molecule called ADP, or, which is the breakdown product of ATP, and that's located in this binding site. And that happens with crystallography. You sometimes capture things with different nucleotides or different nucleotide states that you capture in the reaction cycle. So in this case, we have NBD2 with ADP uh, and not ATP. And we can start to think about now how these two things come together. Uh, and so now we have the ABCC6 NBD1 shown in purple and the NBD2 um, shown in green. And again, if you kind of look at these, you can see that the patterns look more or less similar. We could, we could make some images to show you, but, but it's really not so important exactly for this talk. And then we've put the ATP molecules in. There's an ATP molecule that we've, we've modeled into the NBD1 site and the ADP that we've determined experimentally in the NBD2 site. We basically end up with um, these two proteins 
sort of halfway between the totally open state that, that I showed you on the prior slide where the NBDs are dissociated and halfway to the fully dimerized where they're stuck together with the ATP. And if we can look at the surfaces down at the bottom and basically model uh, the conformation that these are in so that we can see the nucleotides, uh, again, the ATP and the ADP. And this one's modeled, the ATP is modeled, and the ADP uh, has been determined experimentally. This gives us, starts to give us a sense and a template to which we can think about the, the way the engine for ABCC6 uh, works. And, and while these are very well conserved across the ABC transporters, all of them are subtly different. So those are the structures and what we really wanted to do is think about that the folding and if you remember I said that before you can get these structures you have to make this linear chain of amino acids and then it actually has to fold up and make the right structure make these three dimensional structures. So what we've actually done is profile the whole series of PXE associated gene variants. When we started this project seven or eight years ago, we went through the ABCC6 database that PXE International was maintaining, and we simply pulled out all of the protein variants, all of the gene variants that were in these two regions of the protein. And we asked the question, what happens, it's a simple question, what happens to the biosynthesis, to the production of these proteins when we introduce each of these gene variants? And we can look it's not important what this experiment is, but we basically can normalize everything to wild type, which is shown on this far left panel. And so the signal for our folding event, the ability to make the protein get it in the right conformation, gets normalized to wild type for each of these different variants. And you can see there are several variants where they behave much like wild types. So for example, E699D or G755R, they basically give a signal that is equivalent to that of the wild type or normal protein. But a variety of these variants are actually very severe and cause almost a complete loss of our signal in this experiment. And we basically interpret this that if it looks like wild type, we know the wild type folds and functions correctly. So a signal that approaches wild type is folded and uh, likely to be, may or may not be functional, but it will likely have the right structure. Variants where you have a loss of the signal, we think are misfolded or incorrect. Now that we have structures, we can actually plot these into the structures by their severity on the structure. And really this, the, the important thing is you can start to see trends if you stare at these long enough where the severity of the mutation, which we show is this, this this heat map, so the most severe mutations are in red, get localized in different regions of the proteins to mutations or variants um, that are in other regions of the structure. So these structures now give us the ability to sort of interpret, uh, along with a lot of biochemical data, what the effects of uh, variations in ABCC6 are. So we've done the same experiment by then taking those variants and looking at the trafficking of the full length protein. So this experiment is much like the cell slide that I showed you, the red and green slide earlier, where the normal protein will traffic out to the periphery of the cell. It'll give us a band in our Western blot, mutant or variants that impact the structure of the protein significantly won't do that. They won't traffic properly and you'll lose the strong signal and you'll see this lower, uh, small, smaller band here. And we sort of interpret this the same way that if you see a variant here with a strong large shift in band, that this is folded correctly. And things that misfold or that have altered biosynthesis either have decreased amounts of protein or this single sort of lower band in each of these positions. By looking at these two things together, the folding of the individual piece of the protein and the full length protein, we can start to, to think about how that pathway comes together. And this is a complicated slide, but I really just want to highlight a couple of features uh, on all of this. Each of these data points for us is a, um, on this slide, is a specific gene variant. So if uh, the wild type protein, and we normalize everything to the wild type protein for the folding of the small domain, the piece in isolation, or the folding of the full length protein. So ideally, we would like all of the protein variants to be clustered around the wild type, and that would give us a normal protein structure. Basically, any deviation to the lower left from this uh, suggests that there's a problem in the production or the development of these protein structures. 
And without going into details, by doing these analyses and including a couple of dozen additional mutations, we basically have been able to um, identify different classes of mutations that appear to cluster in the structures differently. So this class one mutation tends to be on the inside of these proteins. All of these mutations that are sort of in this left oval that runs sort of almost diagonal up and down on the uh, left-hand side of the plot are in class one. Mutations that cluster in this lower oval uh, tend to be in the class two types of mutations. And then these that are shown in green, uh, we know are what we call class three mutations. And these are actually functional mutations. So the structure and the biosynthesis of the proteins is unaffected, but the ability for this protein uh, to do the chemistry it needs to do to transport things is affected. And having these structures now enables us to look at these in much bigger detail or better detail to have a feel for how mutations sort of group in a structural manner. So what can we do with this? I mean, this is an interesting academic question, but really the question is once you build the pathway out, can you think about how that might work for therapeutic development? And so we've, we've worked on this as well. And one of the things that, I'm gonna go back a slide, one of the things that we appreciated from these data was that the folding events, the, the biosynthetic events that lead to the production of the folded protein, there's what we call cooperativity. And uh, it means that things don't happen in isolation, that different pieces of the protein have to interact with one another. And the, the loss of that cooperativity is in part of the reason that we think we've got these two different classes of mutations that sort of run along this diagonal here and along the x-axis along at the bottom of the protein. And without going into a whole lot of detail about that, we knew from studies of ABC proteins that we could potentially use other uh, mutations to increase the cooperativity of the protein, so to, to restore that effect. And we do that by trapping ATP in these between the nucleotide binding domains. So this cartoon at the, on the upper left is much like I showed you in prior slides where we don't have ATP bound. In the left-hand cartoon, we add ATP, which is these two little orange uh, circles, the nucleotide binding domains come together, and then the resulting change in the transmembrane uh, parts of the protein is shown by sort of the, the A to V transition of these two uh, rectangles. And we knew we could make mutations, specifically this E1427Q, that blocked the ATP hydrolysis so that we couldn't go back to this state. We would start here, we would bind ATP, we'd end up in this state, but we wouldn't actually be able to transition back to the state shown on the left. So we're gluing these two domains together. And we started this analysis by looking at a series of uh, disease-associated mutations in the second nucleotide binding domain, so R1314W, L1335P, and R1339C. And if you compare those to the wild type band, you can see that each of these proteins, we lose most of the protein uh, in our Western blot signal. So the protein levels have decreased. But not only that, this small molecular weight band, this lower band here that I'm highlighting with the cursor is consistent with the band that's stuck on the inside of the cell. So we make the second mutation and we introduce the sort of this glue mutation in so that we trap the nucleotide binding domains we then put this mutation either in the wild type background, and you can see it basically doesn't affect the wild type protein. Now, when we put this E1427Q on the three disease uh, associated alleles, what we see is we see this robust return of protein production, meaning when we glue these two things together, we fix the defects that are associated with the mutations in nucleotide binding domain two. So we're not, we wouldn't propose that this is a way to solve PXE directly, if I could go in and make mutations in the protein and do uh, genetic editing on the protein, I would simply go in and take away the disease-causing mutation, the, the allele. I mean, if that would make the most sense. But it provides a mechanism. It allows us to think about what kind of experiment could we do to think about looking for drugs that might have the same effect. And, and that's sort of the path that this leads us down. We also know that if we do the same experiment and we looked at a whole a, a large number of disease-causing or disease-associated alleles in NBD2. 
what we saw is that the same E to Q mutation, and I apologize that the notation on this slide is a little bit different, but each of these mutations that's highlighted or that's indicated on the diagonal is a PXE associated allele. And then the E is either the E or when we make the glue mutation with the Q. And what you can see in every case, we go from a lack of production to robust production, lack of production to robust production. So this mechanism is general across a large number of mutations in NDD2, which basically is really good news because while each of these individual uh, alleles is fairly rare in PXE, in aggregate, there are a, a significant fraction of the PXE population has missense alleles in NBD2, and almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them respond to this mechanism. Meaning if we could find a small molecule or a drug that had a similar effect and could glue the two nucleotide binding do domains together, during protein biosynthesis, we could potentially restore the trafficking uh, and biosynthesis of a large number of the alleles in NBD2. So just to sort of circle back and summarize where we came from on this, we really have spent a lot of time thinking about these, these first steps of how do we get from the DNA to making a functional protein. And by identifying mechanisms that allow us to modulate protein folding processes, we are now in a position where we can think about looking at assays and, and drug development to do the same kinds of things. Now, I want to emphasize we are not a drug development lab. The drug development is not ongoing. We have a, a small number of small molecule uh, screens that I'll talk about in the next slide, but this basically enables us to think about very specific mechanisms that fix the defect at the level of the protein and that should allow then the physiology, which is a downstream event, uh, to be corrected by having a native state protein to, to do its normal function. So where are we with this? Now that we have high resolution structures and we, we can really understand um, ABCC6 specifically, we're using a variety of computational tools to look for small molecules that bind uh, these domains. So one of the powerful things about having structures is instead of having to go to a large drug company and actually look through libraries of millions of drugs, which is the way this is typically done, for things that restore this, uh, the, the structure of, the, uh, of these proteins, we can do this sort of in silico using computers. So um, we've initiated a handful of uh, small uh, pilot screens where we have found uh, small molecules that bind the nucleotide binding domains either in isolation, so separate from one another, or at this interface uh, between the nucleotide binding domains. And we're in the process of having some of those chemicals synthesized for biochemical studies to see if we can start to think about using those in cell-based screens, and that would provide us a proof of principle for this approach. And I stress these, these are not drugs. They will not likely, the compounds that we have, will not likely uh, make it into a clinical trial. Um, the chemistry and the structures of the molecules we have um, would not be something that uh, a pharmacologist would want to move forward with. So, you know, in our hands, what we're looking to do to, is to develop this as a strategy. So we can also do mechanism-based screening. Um, so many of the assays that we've developed here to, to look at the structures and the energetics of these domains are very specific and we can go in and target the specific defects associated with individual alleles or groups of alleles uh, in the NBDs. And that allows us to basically constrain our efforts. It makes the job of uh, looking for small molecules a little bit easier. And finally, and I think one of the things that's probably going to be very useful is that with the structures we can, and the energetic measurements that we've made, we can actually train algorithms to understand what mutations do. It, it, it may be a higher resolution than what we have now. So in the past, when, when novel uh, gene variants have been identified, we've, the community has used a variety of tools that are sort of generic tools to ask the question if the variant that's found in a specific patient or patient family would really be pathogenic or uh, benign. And uh, many of those tools are not well trained for these proteins. That The computer uh, algorithms that look at those really need a data set of uh, mutations that are in the specific protein so that they can be trained appropriately for the predictive step which comes with the novel variants. 
so we've been we've been running through that and optimizing a variety of algorithms using the mutational data that we have uh, and the structures we have and I think we're converging on some answers where we can probably uh, inform uh, the PXE community as novel variants come up using uh, some computational uh, predictions based on this work. Uh, whether protein, uh, whether gene variants will be considered pathogenic or benign, whether they would have effects on uh, biosynthesis uh, and function. And I think that'll be a very useful and practical tool for the community. And just to end, um, I, you know, one of the challenges, and I know this community is all too uh, familiar with this, but um, when we when we talk about rare diseases, there's a challenge to get um, companies and a community, uh, well, not the patient community, but commercial communities engaged in thinking about uh, screening for small molecules, development of therapeutics, and I, I think the uh, Kandinsky uh, painting several circles sort of illustrates how we think our approach um, maybe will facilitate some of that. So one way to look at this is that if you're may, trying to make a decision about screening for a small molecule or a new drug, you simply look at the disease across the population and the disease prevalence. And a big pharmaceutical company is happy to screen for a new drug for heart disease or antihistamine allergy, uh, you know, all, all the drugs that you see that come on primetime commercials. There's lots of money to be made for them for widespread diseases. And we, so we can think about each of these circles as sort of the footprint that a disease might have on the human population and heart disease might be the biggest circle or cancer might be a big circle. And PXE, if you, if you take that view or cystic fibrosis would be the same way, is one of these really small circles. And that's maybe not such a good thing if we, if we view it from this classical way. We can think about this, we can kind of turn this on its head and we can also think, well, maybe the other sort of dangerous way to think about it is if this is a single disease and we've got a bunch of alleles that all have different mechanisms that they can act on the protein. So maybe this is this particular yellow spot causes the protein to adopt one incorrect conformation. The red spot does something else, et cetera. Each of these represents a slightly different variation on a theme. This is also problematic because it will be hard to find a drug that fixes the defect that's associated with these mutations versus these other dot mutations. But by sort of turning this on its head, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand the commonality in the different alleles. So if we can find a single mutation, like I showed with that glue mutation, or a single mechanism, like I showed with that glue mutation that stuck the NBD2, uh, rescued the NBD2 variants, that moves those variants, it sort of clusters a bunch of these circles together and provides a single mechanism of rescue for a larger population of alleles, all of a sudden searching for some of these things for individual low frequency alleles is less problematic. It's still a major challenge. It's still economically difficult. But if we can start to understand common mechanisms that will pool the patient population in terms of mechanisms of rescue together, we might be able to think about moving along a path towards small molecule development that then would basically provide therapeutic relief for a large uh, fraction of the PXC population. And I'll just leave it there. I think that's my, my summary is the, the direction we're going is trying to understand if we can find mechanisms, if we can find specific means by which we can target ABCC6 to fix these defects, that we can restore its structure and function and then the, the appropriate physiology for patients uh, for disease uh, real therapeutics. And by doing this work and by starting to understand how all these mutations interplay with one another, I think we're on a path where we can identify common mutations. And I think some of that will emerge as a, as a potential for therapeutic development uh, down the road. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Patrick, for your wonderful presentation. We will close for today and see you guys at our next webinar.